Wouldn't unconditional basic income just cause massive inflation? By far the most common concern in regards to my first article on Medium about the idea of an unconditional basic income was that all prices would inevitably go up as a result, immediately reducing the value of each dollar and essentially creating a new zero. Let's call it the new zero argument against basic income. The new zero argument is effectively, quote, Although a noble idea to give money to those in need, no one would actually be better off as a result of basic income due to everything costing more, especially rent, and therefore the policy idea is entirely pointless because the only thing it would attain is a new zero." End quote. In economic terms, this concern is the fear of inflation or even hyperinflation and it is possibly the most common reflex to the notion of just transferring more money to the lower and middle classes. So how grounded in reality is this concern? First, we need to understand that basic income is not the idea of printing three trillion new dollars every year and dropping in on everyone from helicopters. Although there are arguments to be made that to a lesser degree this could be done on a temporary and varying basis as economic stimulus or according to perceived economic conditions as a kind of quantitative easing for people instead of banks. The money for a basic income guarantee would be already existing money circulated through the economic system. It would not be new money, just money shifted from one location to another. This means that the value of each dollar has not changed. The dollar itself has only changed hands. It is also important to note the observation that even when money supply is vastly expanded, the effects on prices need not be extreme. For example, the Fed's quantitative easing added over four trillion new dollars to the US money supply, and the results were not enough inflation as defined by the Fed. Quote, but even with the trillions of dollars pumped into the economy, the Fed has been perpetually unable to get inflation up to the 2% level it aims for, except for the occasional brief period. There is good news in that predictions by many Fed critics that QE would unleash vicious hyperinflation have come nowhere close to materializing. But neither has it been enough for the Fed to reach its self-imposed goal. In an economy trying to get out from under an overhang of debt, where excessive unemployment is the leading problem, too low inflation can be deeply problematic and hold back growth. QE has not been powerful enough to generate as much inflation as the Fed says it wants." End quote. So even though basic income would not be printing new money for everyone, even if it were, inflation would not be a guaranteed result. With that understood, to then understand how much we should actually fear rising prices as a result of redistributing existing money from one place to another instead of printing new money requires some studying, but the short answer is that capitalism not only still exists with basic income, it is enhanced. By enhanced, I mean there is growing evidence from where basic income has been actually tried that it increases entrepreneurship. We also have actual examples of partial basic incomes that we can examine for inflationary evidence. Aside from this evidence, we also need to understand how increased demand leading to higher prices isn't as simple as we might think it is, and how when it comes to housing prices in a future where everyone has basic incomes, we are likely to see some very interesting market adjustments. Meanwhile, fears involving unearned income and increased velocity require a closer examination. Because all of the above that needs to be understood in order to more fully examine the question of basic income and inflation, I have split off the above information into four separate smaller articles. Let's call them exhibits A, B, C, and D. Exhibit A. It's not like we don't have any evidence of what happens when a lot of money is given universally to a lot of people. Consider the following real-world examples. There's evidence from Alaska. Every year, every qualifying resident of Alaska receives an annual dividend provided by the Alaska Permanent Fund. The payout was $1,884 in 2014 for every man, woman, and child in Alaska. The first payout of $1,000 occurred in 1982. According to the New Zero argument that any sizable universal cash transfer leads directly to its own nullification, 
This dividend paid to everyone should be entirely eroded by inflation. This hypothesis can be tested using the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. If inflation is a direct result of giving free money to everyone, we should see the CPI of Alaska begin to rise faster than the CPI of the rest of the country starting in 1982. So what did happen? Ever since 1982, Alaska has had lower inflation than the entire U.S. CPI data reveals that prior to 1982, $1 did not go as far in Alaska than it did in the U.S. as a whole. 1982 was the last year this was true. Beginning in 1983, $1 in Alaska began to be worth more than in the U.S. as a whole, and this trend continues to this day. The partial base income provided in Alaska in the form of their permanent fund dividend directly counters the fear of inflation with 30 years of a once larger CPI that began to grow at a slower rate than the rest of the country immediately following its introduction. Alaska isn't even the only evidence we have for the possibility that a basic income might even reduce inflation instead of increasing it. In 2011, the government in Kuwait decided to give every one of its 1.155 million citizens $4,000 each. That's even higher than the Alaska dividend and about one-third of a potential U.S. basic income. It was called the Amiri Grant. Again, the New Zero argument suggests inflation should increase, and this was a common fear in Kuwait as well. They were even especially worried because inflation was already a problem, so it seemed like the worst possible time for such a huge citizen demigrant. So what did happen? Nine months later, quote, with a great deal of public spending coming on stream and the effects of the substantial Amiri grant of $3,605 awarded to every Kuwaiti, inflationary pressure is a concern. However, inflation dropped to an 11-month low of 4.6% in July, the last month for which figures were available, and the rate is expected to average 4.7% for full year 2011, according to international press reports using figures from Kuwait's Central Statistics Office. Six more months later, quote, beyond the activity data, Kuwait's macroeconomic outlook continues to look very solid. After peaking at 6% in December 2010, consumer price inflation had decelerated to 3.8% by February 2012. End quote. So in Kuwait, just as in Alaska, giving a large amount of free money to citizens did not only result in increased inflation, but instead in decreased inflation. Now, what about the evidence for enhanced capitalism through basic income's increased entrepreneurship effect? And what does this mean for inflation concerns? In Uganda, the government gave about a year's worth of income, or about $380, to a group of applicants and denied it to the other half. There were no conditions on the money, but those who got it invested most of it in skills and business assets, ending up 65% more likely to practice a skilled trade. Recipients worked an average 17 hours more than those without the money. And compared to the group that didn't get the cash, those who did saw a 49% increase in earnings two years later and a 41% increase four years out, indicating that the effects last. A similar study in Kenya found that after poor families in rural Kenya were given an average of $513 by an NGO, their assets and holdings were 58% higher than a control group a year later, Incomes were 33% higher, hunger was significantly reduced, and their psychological well-being increased. Similar programs in South Africa, Mexico, and Liberia have all found similar results. Increased entrepreneurship has also been found in Madhya Pradesh, India, where all adults in a number of villages received basic incomes and those with children received additional income. They invested in seeds and pesticides for growing their own food. They invested in livestock like goats, oxen, chicken, and cows. They bought capital like sewing machines for their own businesses, making and selling clothing. There was a significant shift from paid labor to self-employed labor. Quote, Far from encouraging laziness, the cash transfers have brought more work, more productivity, largely because they have inspired more own-account farm and other working opportunities as an alternative to wage labor. 
over one in five of the basic income villages increased their work activities, twice as many as in the control villages, and most of the villagers attributed the new farm or new business activity to the provision of the grants. Basic income villagers increased their livestock by 70%. So basic income is not only a welfare story, it is a growth story too. Inclusive and bottom-up growth that has stimulated the local economy, end quote. As repeatedly observed, as a direct result of basic income, new businesses are created by those suddenly finding themselves with the capital to create them. In addition, these new endeavors, along with those small businesses already existing, find themselves with more customers, with more cash to spend on their goods and services. Unless these businesses next create cartels in order to illegally fix prices, this inevitably leads to increased competition as each business seeks to be the one to attract new customers and their new dollars. This is important to understand as a business owner. As long as the competition exists, if you raise your prices, to take the basic incomes of others, those who don't will get their money instead and your business could fail as a result. Exhibit B, Supply and Demand Variables. To inform inflationary fears on a more academic basis, it's important to understand the basic variability of supply and demand and how it applies to various goods and services. First, unchanged demand. Right now, milk has a certain cost. Thanks to SNAP, aka food stamps, even those without money are presently obtaining milk. A basic income would just be a cash form of food stamp, and so the demand for milk is unlikely to change much. People who already buy milk are unlikely to buy more milk. They will just be using cash instead of EBT cards. Because demand has not gone up, there is no reason for cost to go up, and where cost does go up due to greed, competition will do its intended job. Why buy $8 milk at Greedy Store A when you can get it at Not Greedy Store B for the $4 you're used to spending on milk? Store A should find it difficult to sell $8 milk unless people have no other choices. However, this also provides incentive for Store C to enter the market and cater to all these customers who were previously ignored when they had little to no money to spend. As a result, a basic income should also reduce the existence of food deserts. As an additional note, milk is actually a good now being obtained through robots with vastly less effort. Next, decreased demand. It's not even true that greater income necessarily results in greater demand. There are goods and services that actually experience decreased demand when incomes increase. Think buses. Think baloney. Economists call these inferior goods because when people have the option of purchasing better options, they prefer the better options. For example, a lot of people ride the bus and eat bologna sandwiches because that's all they can afford to do. As soon as they have more money, instead of riding buses, they buy a car. Instead of bologna, they buy a roast beef. Therefore, the prices of goods like bologna might actually go down with basic income and the attempts by stores to try to get people to buy stuff when customers no longer want the stuff. There's also increased demand plus flexible supply. There will be goods that experience an actual increase in demand. These goods are those that people currently want and aren't able to afford, but will be able to afford with a basic income supplementing their wages like an actual raise would. These particular goods and services will be affected differently based on varying ability to scale up manufacturing. This is where industrial capacity enters the inflation equation. Where supply can be easily scaled up to meet increased demand, prices are unlikely to rise. Think digital goods like iTunes. Where it can't, prices will be likely to rise. Think original Van Gogh paintings. But how many of us are planning on buying one of those? Another example of the former would be machine-made designer purses, and another example of the latter would be handmade designer purses. So the question becomes, what kind of purse and how many can we make using existing production capability? In 2014, we were operating in the U.S. at about 79% of our current total industrial capacity. 
If demand shot up across the board, prices would only need to rise if our utilization jumped to 100%. However, another caveat is that usually businesses invest revenues to increase capacity when they hit their supply ceilings so that they can obtain even more revenue by meeting increased demand with increased supply. So as capacity tops out, it gets increased wherever possible. To not increase capacity where possible would be bad business, essentially leaving money on the table. In this way, price increases due to lack of capacity tend to be temporary with the exception of very limited goods and services. It is for these same reasons that it is considered common sense among economists to recommend policies that get more income into the hands of those more likely to immediately spend it, i.e. anyone not rich, whenever the economy is operating at less than full capacity, because as long as that holds true, GDP will rise and prices won't. Understanding that demand will not increase across the board especially for food and other basic goods everyone already purchases, and that where demand does increase, not all supply will be unable to increase to meet it, it is easier to recognize that rising prices will be limited to certain goods and services that can be considered more luxuries than they are basic essentials. So yes, a basic income can definitely result in higher prices, but should we avoid paying higher prices on luxuries like Van Gogh paintings so that those who can't afford any luxuries at all can continue not being able to afford even the basics? Is it more important for someone earning seven figures to be able to afford a hundredth pair of handmade shoes for $225 instead of $200 than it is for the working poor to afford to eat three solid meals a day under one roof? Exhibit C, Google Homes and Wiki Houses. Being that many of us spend the greatest portion of our incomes in one place on rent, and that they seem to just go up and up without end, rising rent is a significant fear in general, let alone in regards to giving people more money. To address this fear, we first need to look at the particular location in question and understand how many vacant homes there are compared to homeless, as not all places have the same room to grow. Here in the United States, there are about five vacant homes for every one homeless person. That's a lot of excess supply and room for development in a future of guaranteed income for food and housing needs. These vacant homes can be developed alongside entirely new homes in a market where the poor actually have money to live in them, in contrast to the current market where luxury apartments and large houses are the best bet for developers to see good returns on their investments. In addition, because a universal basic income would be the same amount for everyone wherever they currently live, it will unlock people from the existing requirement of living where the best jobs are. People will therefore be free to move from areas with higher costs of living to areas of lower costs of living. The effect of this decrease in population density will be downward pressure on prices in high cost of living areas. Not all people will want to spend less on housing though. Some will want to use the extra money provided by their higher incomes to move into nicer residences. The effect of this will be to open up greater supply at the bottom of the income spectrum, putting even further downward pressure on these prices in high cost of living areas. Meanwhile, new homes are getting cheaper and cheaper to produce as time goes on. 3D printing stands to be a game changer in the future production of new homes. And I don't mean far future, I mean immediate future. In China, a company has already printed 10 houses in a single day using recyclable materials in a $5,000 printer. This technology already exists. It need only be improved and scaled. Combine advancing technology basic income powered new business creation, the competition of continued capitalism, as well as the newly gained ability for people with basic incomes to move from more expensive areas to less expensive areas, and it should become apparent how unwise it would be for those who own property to increase their rents to absorb basic incomes. E.g. if your rent is currently $800 and it gets raised by a greedy landlord to $1,800 to fully absorb your $1,000 per month basic income, what would you do? Your available options won't only be to move into a place for the same $800 you're used to paying. 
Your options will also include the exit option of moving to a cheaper area where rents are $600 or living in the same area in a newly 3D printed affordable home that costs half as much to build. And it is this last option that leads us to the truly inevitable game changer, the Google Home. Let me be clear. The Google Home does not yet exist, at least outside of potential top secret drawing boards at Google X, but it represents the idea of future ultra affordable housing. It will be the realization of the same idea that Henry Ford applied to cars and that Sam Walton applied to retail goods. If you want to make a million dollars, you sell to the few. If you want to make a billion dollars, you sell to the many. We seem to have forgotten this knowledge gained long ago that making a product continually cheaper while maintaining or increasing quality is the path toward complete market dominance. The Model T was a car anyone could afford without even taking out a loan, thanks to Ford continually striving to lower its price. Love it or hate it, Walmart is a living monument to the idea that lowering prices will increase revenue and lead directly to utter market domination. The same is true now for Amazon. There is one company in particular that exists today that knows there is an even better price than cheap. That company is Google, and the price is free. Cheaper is good, but free is best. No price beats free. Dan Ariely covers this well in a chapter in Predictably Irrational, as does Paul Mason when he discusses the future of capitalism. And this is the direction we are going, for better or worse. If you watch the video of Errol Balkan's RSA talk titled Free is a Lie, you'll notice how Google has monetized information to the point it is already reaching into our homes. Its purchase of Nest and Nest's subsequent purchases of Dropcam Revolve gives it an increased ability in this regard. Its creation of a phone that maps space gives it an increased ability in this regard. Google makes products and services available to the masses either free or far cheaper and or better by monetizing the information it can get from the product or service and selling it to third parties instead of asking for money from end users themselves. So where is this going? If Google wants inside our homes, why not just rent us our homes instead? Combine 3D printing with Google Homes and 3D printed Google Homes could be even cheaper than any other form of 3D printed home because it is Google who could best subsidize the cost through the data collection it already leverages. Now, I'm not suggesting this in itself is a good thing, but it's a definite possibility, and it's aligned directly with the direction Google is already going. So what's all this got to do with UBI and inflation? Well, Google could decide to create the cheapest houses possible. Meanwhile, basic income makes possible a guaranteed ability for people to pay Google for these homes. Together combined, these possibilities mean a market for housing on the low end the likes of which we've never seen in history. Imagine a one-bedroom Google home on the rental market for $250 per month in a future where basic income exists. They could even throw in Google Fiber as a package deal. The effect of Google Homes on the rental market would be the same as Google Fiber on the ISP market, entirely disruptive where available. Why pay $100 per month for spotty megabit per second internet from Comcast when you can reliably get a hundred times the speed for the same price from Google. In the same way, why spend a thousand dollars per month on a one-bedroom apartment when you can spend two hundred fifty dollars per month on a one-bedroom Google Home? Because privacy? Are privacy concerns going to stop people from spending only twenty-five percent of their basic income on rent instead of fifty to a hundred percent? And will privacy always be a concern and to everyone? Meanwhile, what about indie tech? There remains the possibility that the open source movement, which also stands to be enhanced with UBI, could provide the same goods and services as Google without the privacy concerns. I believe the Wikihouse exists as an early example of this possibility. Quote, Architects have struggled to find a viable model for building cheap, fast, single-family homes since the earliest experiments with prefab in the 1900s. It's an idea that we still grapple with today, and Wikihouse is its direct descendant a project to publish open source building plans online for anyone to download designed to require only the most basic knowledge of construction to create. The average cost of buying a home in America hovers around $300,000. WikiHouse 4.0 can be built from scratch for less than a third of that." End quote. 
Right now, someone can already build their own wiki house themselves for about $80,000. This will only go down with each newer version. What if WikiHouse 10.0 costs $29,000? That's a monthly mortgage of again about $250 and paid off in 15 years instead of 30. When people have basic incomes, will no one go this route to maximize their basic incomes by spending the least amount as possible on their rents or mortgages? Basically, it seems to me that if Google X isn't already working on Google Homes, they should be, and with a basic income guarantee in existence in the form of an unconditional basic income or a negative income tax, it seems even more likely. With the arrival of basic income policy, there will be a huge market created for ultra-affordable homes to rent or buy. Combined with everyone's newly gained ability to live anywhere they choose instead of being anchored to where jobs exist, this will undoubtedly introduce downward pressure on housing prices, especially when Google or someone else gets into the game to dominate this new market with new technologies like wiki houses and large-scale 3D printing. Welcome to the 21st century. Exhibit D, Unearned Income and the Velocity of Money. Two lesser-known economic concerns among those who know of them are possible differences in how we perceive the value of money depending on how it was received and how quickly it is spent. There is a popular conception that when we are given money without earning it, we don't value it as highly. Because of this, the logic goes that if people are given basic incomes, they will be more likely to just throw it all away because it just won't have the same value to them as money they earned in exchange for their labor due to it being unearned. The concern then is this will cause prices to rise because people will be just fine paying $8 for milk instead of $4 because they didn't actually earn the extra $4 required to buy $8 milk. So does this reflect real human behavior? Quote, the value of the basic income affects no change on the ratio of allocation of income, but merely raises expendable income by the expected amount of the basic income, and therefore that there is no theoretical shift in consumption preferences, but merely a shift upwards in the utility maximizing consumption bundle. What has happened in simple microeconomic terms is a simple price and substitution shift, a la Slutsky, end quote. Translation, people treat basic income just like the rest of their income, and this is again further backed by the Alaskan PFD, where the spending by Alaskan residents of their unearned dividends supports this permanent income hypothesis with observed behavior. Quote, Net of federal income taxes, about one-third of dividend income went to saving and debt reduction. The majority went to day-to-day -day expenses, and about 10-15% to 15 went to special large purchases. However, when asked what was the most significant effect of the dividend on their consumption behavior, most respondents said it had little or no effect, or that it helped with regular expenses." End quote. Does this sound like people throwing their money away in Alaska? This is not to say there aren't any differences whatsoever between earned and unearned income. The differences more recently found, however, may just surprise you as much as it did the researchers. Quote, Using surveys of lottery winners, we analyze the effects of unearned income on the well-known Big Five personality traits. After correcting for potential endogeneity problems associated with the size of lottery prizes, we find that unearned income improves traits that predict pro-social and cooperative behaviors, preferences for social contact, empathy, and gregariousness, as well as reduce individuals' tendency to experience negative emotional states, all of which are known in the economics literature as incentive-enhancing personality traits. Our results suggest that economists may need to revise their standard conceptual apparatus and come to accept that there may be scope for later intervention to improve the personality traits of adults after all." End quote. So it appears that unearned income of amounts less than $280,000 per year is different than earned income after all, but instead of our perceiving it differently, it makes us perceive differently, and these effects, because they are all valued by employers, can lead to an improved workforce. Unearned income makes people more social, more empathetic, more gregarious, and less neurotic. In any given year, money changes hands at a certain rate. This is referred to as money velocity. 
When an economy is healthy, people exchange a single dollar over and over again. A dollar buys groceries, is given to a cashier as income, is spent by the cashier at a hair salon, is spent by the stylist at a movie theater, and on and on the dollar goes, facilitating exchanges in the market. So velocity can be up. Now imagine an unhealthy economy. There is little buying of haircuts in movies, just groceries. In this economy, the same amount of money exists as in a healthy economy, but no one aside from those with large incomes are really spending it. It's mostly just sitting idle somewhere, unused. So velocity can be down. Which economy do we have? Our velocity, as measured by the St. Louis Adjusted Monetary Base, is lower than it's ever been recorded in U.S. history. We are exchanging our dollars and our money supply more slowly than even during the Great Depression. The reason this is important to understand is that there is another fear increasing velocity will lead to higher prices because of an equation known to economists as the equation of exchange, and that therefore a basic income would be a bad idea because it would allow people to exchange dollars with a greater frequency. This would then lead to higher prices, and higher prices raise fears of runaway prices in 1920s Germany. Even if prices rose because velocity rose, does this outcome seem like something we in no way want? Are we so afraid of higher prices that we don't want people actually exchanging money for goods and services more frequently than during or immediately following the Great Depression? Don't we instead want some kind of middle ground? Well, that's not fair to use the adjusted monetary base of the money supply, some economists might say. It'd be much better to use a smaller measure called M1 because it looks only at actual money and not all the imaginary money out there. Fair enough. Let's look at M1. The velocity of M1 has been crashing since 2007 with no end in sight. No matter what measure one uses to look at the money supply, be it M1, M2, AMB, etc., it all points to systemic and economically problematic underconsumption. Meanwhile, prices need not even rise if the money supply is simultaneously reduced, again because of the equation of exchange. This is one of the tools in our economic toolbox. Additionally, interest rates can also be raised to supply a break to slow velocity. Different forms of taxes can be raised or lowered accordingly as well. We have powerful tools for both increasing and decreasing inflation. Inflation is a boogeyman. Inflation is not the unmanageable danger it is made out to be. It is a complex equation involving multiple variables, and in the context of evaluating the idea of a universal basic income guarantee, because a basic income will be set at a basic level, there is even less to fear. Because we have actual evidence, there is less to fear. Because capitalism will be enhanced, there is less to fear. Because technology will continue to advance and make goods like housing cheaper, there is less to fear. Because our economic capacity is underutilized and underconsumption is systemic, there is less to fear. There is, however, one real thing to fear. Basic income could provide an upward force on wages through increased individual bargaining power and slightly decreased labor force participation rates. And businesses, as a result of new higher labor costs, could raise their prices so as to keep their profits unchanged. This would mean that if you are currently earning $20,000 per year, you'd not only get an extra $12,000 per year in basic income, but also $10,000 in higher wages. Your new yearly income could be $42,000, and groceries might end up costing you an extra 1.4% per month. Would you personally have a problem with earning an extra $22,000 and paying an extra $50 on groceries? Let's assume you would, and that you also think it's wrong the cost of food would go up for everyone else as well, including those with only $12,000 per year basic incomes, and therefore with tighter fixed budgets. There is one last final detail to understand. Any basic income can and should be indexed to match or beat inflation. Just as the minimum wage has eroded over time because of inflation and the political fight over ever raising it, a basic income should automatically rise each year to match inflation so that it doesn't erode in the same way. Better yet, instead of just indexing a basic income to CPI, it could even be indexed to something like productivity 
so that the gains of society continue to accrue more widely for everyone, instead of only the few. Because wages and salaries certainly aren't rising with productivity and haven't for decades. The result of this would be a basic income that always increases faster than inflation, so that each and every year we would be able to buy a greater amount of goods and services than the year before. It cannot be stressed enough that this ability is especially important to enable in advance of the decades ahead of us, as software and hardware continue to decrease the need for human labor and as a result decreases availability of ever decreasing incomes derived from human labor. So why again were we ever worried about inflation? Good question.